Okay, well, my talk actually follows quite nicely from the very end of that last discussion. It's not about working requirements per se, but it is about the question of uh, the uh, fundamental divide that occupies the patent system between what you might think of as the, as the mental and the physical components of invention. Uh, and we see that divide in the theoretical literature, uh, we see it in the history of the case law, and we see it in a variety of different doctrines. And for some people, including I think most of the courts in the 19th century, the fundamental thing that a patent owner contributed was the physical embodiment, the actual delivery of a reduction to practice, something that could get into the world and be used. But for other people conceptually, and increasingly I think in patent law, um, we think of the, the mental conception, the idea itself as the contribution to the world. Uh, and you see this kind of divide, this tension play out uh, in a variety of patent law doctrines. Uh, they maybe most notably in, uh, in our pre-AIA rules for priority, right? When we ask the question, what is invention, right? Is it conception or is it reduction to practice? The answer is, yeah, it's some conception and some reduction to practice, depending sometimes on diligence. And we really do kind of draw from both strands of that literature. Um, we see it also play out in other uh, way, doctrines. The experimental use doctrine is a doctrine that seems to me expressly designed to encourage people to get towards reduction to practice, right? Not towards, uh, uh, not to, to simply come up with an idea and leave it be. We've seen it develop in the recent law of remedies, which treats uh, practicing entities and non-practicing entities differently in some fundamental respects. We see it in the limitations we put on the treatment of trade secrets as prior art. Uh, which seems, I think, uh, to encourage disclosure rather than working if working involves uh, working things out inside your factory. And we see it in cases like FAF, which talk about when an invention is ready for patenting, even in circumstances where it has not yet been built. What I want to suggest in this talk is that um, in the course of those various doctrines, the law has built in a bias towards constructive rather than actual reduction to practice, and that that bias is a bad thing. Uh, so the bias, I think, exists even in the pre-AIA law in a variety of different doctrines, which seem a little bit surprising. Uh, so I think it exists within the framework of defining conception. It is true that, uh, defining invention, it's true that both conception and reduction to practice are the elements of uh, uh, are elements of uh, the invention, uh, but uh, it also turns out that if you are uh, first to conceive and last to reduce to practice, you require diligence to get to reduction to practice, and the diligence we require to get to reduction to practice is a pretty tough standard. Right? We actually impose a pretty uh, strict requirement, and we're, we're quite careful about making sure you've been working towards this in a, in a, in a, in a regular way. What that means is that, um, You'd much rather be the person who was first to reduce to practice as the patent office defines it than the first one to conceive but the last to reduce to practice. You're much more likely to win your case. The easiest way to be the first to reduce the invention to practice is to choose constructive reduction to practice rather than actually building the thing. If you file your patent application rather than waiting until you've actually built the thing, you're going to get to that bar first and the law is going to treat you, uh, all other things being equal, rather better than the person who waited around to actually build something. We see this uh, uh, doctrine, this, this bias play out in other respects as well. The doctrine of prophetic examples, rather interestingly designed to accommodate constructive reduction to practice by saying, you know what, if you actually built something, you actually tested this, you've got to show us the actual experimental data. But if you didn't actually test anything, no problem. Make up some examples, make up some experiments that you think might work. Predict what will happen, and we will treat that as sufficient uh, to satisfy the, uh, uh, the requirements for, for Section 112. And we even have a, a doctrine uh, with, uh, that splits between these two with regard to knowledge of whether or not the invention would work for its intended purpose. We actually require you, in order to satisfy actual reduction to practice, to prove that the invention will work for its intended purpose. But we don't impose that requirement on constructive reduction to practice. Uh, it's enough that it turns out, ultimately, that it works. Of course, if it doesn't turn out to work, it's probably not a useful invention. Uh, there might not be much uh, value in the patent. Uh, 
Uh, in all of these respects, even before the AIA, we've put a thumb on the scale in favor of constructive reduction to practice. We've made it easier. I think the problem's worse under the AIA. Right? First off, it's worse under the AIA for the obvious reason. We've now privileged filing uh, as the relevant uh, 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 time activity, right? So the thing to do, the only thing to do to establish my uh, priority definitively is file a patent application, right? Not build the thing, uh, but file the patent application. We've taken uh, working towards reduction to practice all of the time one might spend in working towards reduction to practice out of the, out of the timing equation altogether. But we may have gone even further. Um, we may have, in the course of the AIA, abolished the experimental use doctrine. Now that sounds a little surprising. We didn't say we were abolishing the experimental use doctrine. Um, I, have, I am rather strongly of the opinion that we ought to carry forward all of the interpretations of public use on sale uh, and the various other things from which that doctrine took its uh, uh, birth uh, into the new AIA. Uh, but a number of uh, people who were involved in the drafting of the AIA uh, have said, no, you know what? The AIA subliminally rethinks what it means to be on sale, to be public use, uh, and in the course of doing that, perhaps rethinks the experimental use doctrine. Indeed, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, uh, in its initial guidance on the AIA, said, we take no position as to whether the uh, experimental use doctrine is still around, uh, it doesn't come up very much, uh, and then a year later they ended up revising that guidance to say, examiners just ignore the existence of experimental use as a defense. Uh, now, that's, of course, not legal precedent. The PTO doesn't get to make that decision, but it suggests that there's at least some uh, reason to worry that the experimental use, might, use defense might disappear altogether. And even if the experimental use is carried, defense is carried forward in the AIA, uh, I think it's going to have less effect. Right? Because the experimental use defense, I, I believe, under the interpretation of the structure of the AIA, is going to be interpreted at most to protect me from the one-year bar date that applies to my own conduct. Uh, uh, it may give me an extension of that one-year rule without losing patent rights with respect to my own conduct, but I think it is less likely the way the AIA is structured to protect me against invalidations based on third-party conduct that occur in the meantime. If my experimental use does not involve a public disclosure of the invention, and many experimental uses will not, they'll happen in secret, uh, then there's reason to worry that there is, because there is no one-year grace period at all in the absence of that public disclosure. There's that one-year grace period won't be extended by the experimental use doctrine, even if that doctrine is intact. So, um, I think encouraging constructive over actual reduction to practice, encouraging paper patenting is unwise. Other people have written on this, and I don't want to go over that ground. Chris Katropia has an excellent paper called The Folly of Early Filing in Patent Law. John Duffy has an excellent paper on paper patentees. Um, but I think what, what, if you summarize the problems or the risks here, right, underdeveloped technologies, technologies that aren't actually uh, developed to the level of reduction to practice, uh, the patents associated with those technologies tend to be broader. Uh, they're written in more generic terms. They're not actually tied to specific technology. Theoretically, we could solve that problem with 112, but we don't seem to be willing to do so. Um, it, the, the existence of the AIA first to file rule and the fact that you can only really protect your rights by getting a patent application on file in many cases drives people to file patents in doubtful cases where they might have chosen not to file ultimately. Right? We have a file first and figure it out later mentality that leads to more patents and leads to patents in circumstances when we might not otherwise want them. We might feel okay with that if we felt like those constructive reduction to practice patents were in fact leading to technology transfer, but in fact the empirical evidence suggests that the amount of technology transfer that comes from non-practicing entities ex ante is small to none. Uh, that in fact uh, these are patents are mostly ultimately turning into troll patents. They're not ultimately, they're not mostly being used to transfer ideas into the hands of people who can use them ex ante. At the, so, a number of people have suggested some form of a working requirement, uh, some form of, of either a requirement that you reduce your invention to practice, that you build a working model before you go to the patent office, uh, or that you actually be a practicing entity. I think that goes too far. 
I think there are legitimate circumstances in which we cannot reasonably uh, expect inventors to build a working model before they file their patent application. There are industries in which it's just not feasible because of the investment scale. There are types of inventors for whom it's not really feasible in most circumstances, universities being an obvious example. But I do think that the law should at a minimum be neutral as between whether or not you have uh, uh, actually decided to reduce your invention to practice. We shouldn't be favoring constructive reduction to practice over, uh, over actual reduction to practice. We ought at least to try uh, to achieve parity between the two. How might we do that? Well, a couple of suggestions in the paper. First suggestion, I think, is we ought to keep the experimental use doctrine. Right? Uh, the experimental use doctrine serves a valuable purpose of allowing people to engage in actually building their invention without sacrificing their own patent rights. The idea that we subliminally eliminated it in the AIA I think is wrong as a matter of statutory interpretation, but it's also a really bad idea as a policy matter. If, we're, if we did eliminate it in the AIA without thinking about it, it's time to recreate it judicially just as we did uh, several decades ago. Second, I think we could strengthen Section 112 uh, in ways that put more limits on constructive reduction to practice uh, than on actual reduction to practice. Right? right now, you get essentially uh, potentially broader patent claims, less constrained by the requirements to show evidence uh, of success and so forth. Uh, I think we could cabin the scope of those patent claims in ways that encouraged people at the margins to choose actual rather than constructive reduction to practice. If you have a prophetic example, we might limit you to that prophetic example. We might say you're not entitled to justify a broad genus claim, for instance, uh, on the basis of no evidence and only supposition as to how this thing might work. Uh, that might encourage people to actually do experimentation if they wanted broad genus claims. Finally, um, I think that one thing we could do that would be a concrete protection for the companies who choose to engage in uh, experimentation and actual reduction to practice is to expand the prior user rights system. The prior user rights system was designed to basically substitute for the uh, Section 102G actual reduction to practice proof that I was in fact really the first inventor and I was just working on it. When we got rid of that system as an invalidation mechanism, we replaced it with a personal defense, the prior user right defense. But that prior user right defense is pretty limited in, in various respects. Most notably, it's limited because it, it requires that I have to show that I actually was using this, this invention in my business more than a year before you filed your patent application. What I suggest is a fairly simple modification that extends prior user right defenses not to those who were actually making commercial use of the invention at that time, but also to those who were engaged in bona fide experimentation about, of the invention at that time. And if we do that, the people who are engaged in experimentation won't invalidate the constructive reduction to use patent, but they will at least be protected against liability incurred because they made the choice to actually build something uh, rather than just run to the patent office. And I think that would be a substantial step in the direction of encouraging people to actually build, uh, not simply to, to run to the patent office. The, I don't know that we have to resolve the debate over whether the fundamental aspect of the patent system is mental or physical, but I think it is worth recognizing that they're both important contributions, and if we privilege the mental aspect over the physical aspect, um, and we discourage actually producing products that go into the marketplace, I think we're doing a disservice to the patent system. Thanks. Questions? So how does this fit in with prospect theory? So the claim would be that you need the patent in order to support your investment in RTD. Right. Um, I think it probably fits poorly with prospect theory, but I also think prospect theory is wrong. Uh, I mean, I, you know, it's not, it, empirically, it's, it, it almost never turns out to be true. And I think, I guess what I would say is, You could tell a story that was consistent with prospect theory in the 19th century when you could get a patent in a few weeks or a few months, right? When the average time before getting a patent is four to five years, right? If it, if it really were the case that nobody was going to invest in actually building anything until, actually, until they got a patent, uh, we'd see a completely different uh, uh, behavior among companies than we actually did. Sarah? Yeah, so I, I think it's an interesting project, but I also, the formulation of this mental versus physical thing, I think, my, my lead to some interesting avenues. I mean, I, I would say 
you talk about the mental processes and how those have been treated in other areas of patent law, for example, like there's a clear privileging of the physical. And so it's sort of interesting that, you know, with our yeah. 101 jurisprudence on the way that it is, that there's simultaneously this, this other strand. So I just think they, I don't know if that's a question, but I think that they sort of complement. It's an implied. It's a. Uh, it's a law professor question. All, all law professor questions are statements with an implied. Isn't that right at the end, right? Uh, so yeah. So it's a great point, right? And I think we're, so. The the what the the recent 101 jurisprudence in the software world, not I think the biotech world, right, does seem to have this physicality component to it. I don't think that makes a lot of sense. Honestly, but it is right that that if true, that's a that's something that pushes you in a in a different direction. Now, what's odd is I don't know that it pushes you in a productive direction, right? Because what it says is put a bunch of physical hardware elements in your software and business method patent claims, right? Um, uh, those aren't really the things you would have to be experimenting with, right? I could uh, I could just as easily be a paper patentee who never built anything, who wrote in a bunch of technological hardware uh, uh, to my patent claim, because I, that's not really where the no point of novelty in the invention is. But it's it's still a fair point. John, um, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, Duffy, yeah, with, but yeah, yes, sorry, okay. Being more specific, um, I actually was going to say you you shouldn't. Um, give up on the prospect theory so, so okay. easily. Um, because, and here's why, because I think what you can say is you can be agnostic about whether the prospect theory works in any particular case. But if it does work, if it's, if, if we started to say this, if you do need the patent in order to invest and actually build something, then that person, there won't be this situation where somebody else has constructively reduced, reduced to practice and then not built it. You're going to get a situation like the situations in you know the cases that in the article I, that you mentioned uh, that I wrote, where somebody did this you know initial thing that either wasn't practiced or failed, and somebody else did it, either without patenting um, or with another patent, and there you, there you can say, well, if in that situation, the the prospect function clearly wasn't in play. There might be other yep. circumstances where you yep. have broad initial patents and people need to do that. But you won't get into these situations then, or those people will have uh, done uh, the building function through themselves or their licensees, if the prospect function. Yep. I, so I, it's, a great, it's a good point. I actually have been thinking quite recently about um, not so much prospect theory, but quite related, right, the commercialization <laughs> stories, right? right? That sort of where the reason we need patents is not to encourage invention, but to encourage commercialization. One interesting characteristic of those stories, it seems to me, is that if they're true, uh, we shouldn't see patent litigation, right? Um, we should, right, so, uh, I, Different kinds of that. Well, uh, not, why, right? So, so if the theory is nobody will build this thing without the, uh, uh, the promise, without the, the fact that they've got the patent and they've got the exclusive right to do it, right, then if somebody sues somebody else for patent infringement, that's a disproof of the theory in that case, right? That is, somebody else did, in fact, build it, and I went ahead and sued them. So it doesn't mean, I think, that theoretically it's not possible, but I do think it's, I, I think we, it's something that we would observe, we would want it, we would expect to observe mostly outside of the context of patent litigation, right, rather than inside it. Dimitri. So I wonder if you need to reform prior art rules to a greater degree than you've suggested in your talk if you adopt this build theory, because, you know, it, it brings to mind that lobby of prospect. In your mind, you're experimenting, but under the line of experimenting, right? You don't know what the rules are. And so maybe, because when you build something, you're more likely to have 102B or even metalizing, you're contracting with people, you know, and accidentally maybe disclosure. So maybe you need to have other protections to like on sale bars and metalizing bars. Maybe, I, don't know. Uh, I mean, I, so. Uh, I, I certainly don't want to be read as suggesting the experimental use defense is a panacea. I think it has a number of problems, not least of which is, uh, as the as the dissent in Lau versus Brunswick said, right, here's the poor guy who's just building a, a, a boat engine and he hasn't read all the patent law cases, so he doesn't know the right way to protect himself in experimental use. I think we could have a robust experimental use defense that was more clearly designed uh, uh, that actually uh, it, made it obvious to people what it is they needed to do to take advantage of it. That said, a good first step would be having an experimental use defense in the first instance. All right, two minutes. Yeah, good job. So I mean, there's obviously this big advantage to paper, early patent, paper patenting uh, on the other side, which is that it gets the patent term running more quickly. And yes. Firing more quickly. Another paper of John. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> firing more quickly as well. And it's funny, there's sort of this funny tension between 
your argument in this paper, what I've heard from you in other work, or what I've heard from Lucas earlier today about how it's so easy now with 3D printing to create physical things. You, the, all you need is the idea, and then the physical thing is a trivial advantage over that. So I guess at some point in the middle of the talk, I heard you say, well, this could all be solved if courts policed uh, the 112 requirement more accurately and actively, but that's really not going to happen. And, and so I guess I want to ask, why do you think that these other sorts of fixes are going to be successful in that way? Now, why isn't it that the conclusion of your paper, early patenting is great so long as courts really do a good job on enablement, and so we just need to make sure that courts do a really good job on enablement, as opposed to, you know, we think courts will fail here, so let's make a lot of other tweaks with maybe more confidence that they're going to get those tweaks correct. Yeah. Well, so I, I, I don't want, I, first off, I don't want to exclude the possibility of solving 112. In fact, I included 112 changes as, as among the things that I would encourage us to do, right? So um, I think, the, the question I think becomes um, how much improvement we can, uh, how much strengthening of 112 we can engage in that's not inconsistent with paper patenting, right? So you clearly could say, must actually test. Right? That would be a substantial uh, strengthening of 112 that would solve a number of these problems, but it would also make most paper patentees go away. Right? You couldn't actually satisfy uh, that requirement unless you'd actually built a model and tested it. Uh, so I think there may be some structural limits on the ability of 112 to, to solve the, some of these problems without, as long as we're willing to accept constructive reduction to practice as a part of the patent system. What 112 could do, I think, one, one of the, the, the focus for me on where I think we could, can do it is the excessive scope problem. To me, it's functional claiming, right? And so uh, I think there's no necessary relationship between uh, paper patenting and, fu and broad functional claiming that's, that's abstract, but I think there is in practice a demonstrable relationship between the two, right? The people who just had an idea and didn't actually get to working it out tend to write their patent claims in the, in the broad general terms that have caused more problems than the, uh, than the narrower patent claims. So we might get at the problem indirectly in 112 by narrowing the scope of the patent claims. I still don't think that gets us all the way there. And your, your point about um, uh, sort of 3D printing and the physicality, I think, is a, is a perfectly fair point. I, I, I think there, are, there may well be industries in which we should care less about uh, reduction to practice and more about the design, although, honestly, uh, to me, um, the right question for 3D printing is what do we mean by reduction to practice? And in a world with ubiquitous 3D printing, I would view an actual reduction to practice as the development of a design that will actually run in a 3D printer. Right? I don't care that you actually physically print the thing. Did I actually give you a design or did I just say, hey, here's something you one might figure out how to design and put in a 3D printer. And that would be, that seems to me where we are with constructive reference. All right, thank you.